Good morning. Welcome to ICERI. I am so thrilled for the opportunity to share the science of learning with you today. My name is Dr. Pooja Agarwal. I'm a teacher. I'll share more of my experience with you today. As a teacher, I'd like us to start with a question. So I'm going to give you a trivia question, and then we'll take a vote to see how you do. No cheating, okay? All right, here's the question. How many bones are in the adult human body? We all have about the same number of bones. It's different when we're children. So how many bones do we have in the adult human body? Here are your three options. 124 bones, 186 bones, or 206, 206. I see some of you comparing answers with your partners next to you. Is it A, 124, B, 186, or 3, 206? If you would say the number of bones in the human body is 124, raise your hand, please. Oh, don't be shy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> if you'd say A, raise your hand. If you'd say B, we have 186 bones in our body. Please raise your hand. Fantastic. And if you'd say C, we have 206 bones. Ah, you are correct. Some of you are probably science teachers, I bet, right? So we have 206 bones in our body. Now, I wanted to share with you a lot of the resources, the research that I'll be mentioning today are at this special website for us, retrievalpractice.org slash iCERI, I-C-E-R-I. There, again, you can download resources. I have more than 100 resources for free for teachers around the world in six different languages. You can subscribe for my newsletter. So I hope that the research I share with you today and those practical teaching strategies are very helpful for you. Now, I am a teacher, as I mentioned, and I'm a researcher. I'm a memory scientist. I've been conducting research on how students learn for about 20 years. Also, as a teacher, I started in elementary school, primary school, as a fourth and fifth grade teacher, and now I teach college students in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. I'm a science teacher, a science professor. I'm fortunate to teach science at the Berklee College of Music in Boston, so I get to teach science to musicians. It's so incredibly cool. I have about 200 college students every school year. They're all waiting for their, their grades, right? Um, so I'd like you to think back to your own educational experience. Mentally pick out a high school class that you took, a college class that you took, that you had to study really hard for. Do you have a class in mind? I'm thinking about my Greek mythology class from uh, high school. And I had to cram so hard for it. I had to stay up all night, pull an all-nighter, go through so many of my notes, and reread the chapter. This is stressful for us and for our students to do all this cramming beforehand. Now, for many of us, hooray, we got an A on the exam or the paper. We did really well. And then what happens? Once you do all that cramming, you do really well on the test, what happens? I see this. <laughs> you forget it all, right? It's all gone from your head. There is very little, to be honest, that I remember from my own high school or college experience. And this is so frustrating to continue going through this process of forgetting. It's frustrating for our students so many times. My students have to learn and then forget and then spend all that time relearning. And for us as teachers and professors, that is incredibly frustrating. How often have you said, I swear I taught you that last year? And then you have to reteach it. It feels like this waste of time. So a question that has really driven my research for 20 years is why do students forget? 
And of course, as teachers, what can we do about that? Now, we know from a lot of research and a lot of personal experience that we typically focus on getting information into our heads. We typically focus on getting information into our students' heads. This is the first stage of learning that we call encoding. We encode information. I'm hopefully getting information into your head right now. We encode, we hope it gets stored somewhere in there. A hundred years of research demonstrates that the magic of learning happens when we get information out of our head. So we typically focus on getting information into our heads, into our students' heads. We need to get information out of their heads. This is a research-based principle we call retrieval practice. Now, retrieval practice is like my music students. They're engaging in retrieval practice constantly. They're pulling information out from their minds. They have to practice their instruments. They know that they cannot cram the night before a performance. That's not going to work. <laughs> They have to practice along the way and pull that information out of their heads. They can't just watch YouTube videos or watch someone else play guitar. They engage in that mental retrieval practice. I want to go into some basic, simple, practical strategies you can use in your classrooms, you can use in higher education. How often do we start classes by reviewing information for our students? All right, class, here's what we covered last week. And here's what we're about to cover. That's reviewing. That's getting information into our student's head. One of the simplest research-based switches does not take you any extra time at all is to encourage students to retrieve. What did we cover in class last week? That's it. It's simply switching from getting information into our students' heads to improving their long-term learning by getting information out of their heads. Here's another simple strategy. We call it a brain dump. In the scientific literature, we refer to this as free recall. And this is simply asking students, write down everything you can remember. Write down everything you can remember from class today. Write down everything you can remember that we learned last week. Write down everything you can remember that we've learned the entire school year. It's called a brain dump. And this free recall, this process of retrieval practice, research demonstrates helps students organize information, and it helps solidify their memories for what they're learning. A sort of more simple approach that I'm a big fan of is what I call two things. It could be three things, it could be four things, but it's simply a little bit more specific. Retrieve two things you remember from yesterday. Retrieve two things you remember about mitosis and meiosis. Retrieve two things you remember from math class. That's it, just retrieving two things. So I often ask my students, what's one thing you remember from last week? What's the second thing you remember from last week? Another aspect based on research is, sure, we can ask our students, what did you learn in class today? That's retrieval practice. That's immediate. A build, a level up on retrieval practice is what we call spacing. So instead of asking students, what did you learn in class today, is to ask students, what did you learn yesterday? If you've ever asked your children, what did you learn in school today, and they say, Nothing. It's because it's kind of a boring question. If you ask them, what do you remember from school yesterday, then they're engaged. They're going through this process of mental effort and retrieval practice. It's what we call a desirable difficulty. That mental challenge to think back, that's a desirable difficulty that improves learning. Just like my students have to practice their instruments, they have to go through this retrieval practice as well. If you use think, pair, share in your classrooms or in your colleges, can you raise your hand? Think, pair, share. Yeah. It's a fairly common strategy all over the world, right? Here's a picture of my students engaging in some think, pair, share. Oftentimes, we might give students a prompt. Um, you know, think of an example from your own life when you had to use multiplication for a very simple example. We ask students to think about that prompt, then we pair them up to discuss their ideas, and then we share with the whole class. What we typically do 
is we skip that think step. Don't skip that think step. That's where the mental effort comes in. That's when students are retrieving. I know we like to move on to the pair and share. It's so much more engaging. But don't skip the think step. So I know a lot of these strategies are really helpful for in-classroom students, but imagine if your entire department at your college or university, your entire college or university used these research-based practical teaching strategy. Now, I'd like to acknowledge that these strategies apply for a wide variety of content areas. You know your content area best, whether you teach math, science, literature, your professors know their content best. This is where, for me, the fun of retrieval practice happens, where we get to be creative as teachers. Maybe two things doesn't apply to your content. Maybe a brain dump applies better. So you know your content area best. Use that creativity to think about how can you get information to pull, uh, how can you use retrieval practice to pull information out of students' heads? Now, maybe you're skeptical. I'm a big skeptic. I'm a teacher. If someone says, you should do this, I'm like, mm, no, I'm not going to do that, right? So maybe you're already skeptical. I'd like to walk you through this a little bit. Maybe you're thinking, am I going to have to prepare more for class? Are my professors going to have to prepare more? No. Retrieval practice doesn't involve preparation at all, just the basic idea of two things. That doesn't require coming up with questions or coming up with quizzes in advance. That's just asking students to retrieve two things. Does it require more classroom time? I know that our class time is valuable. We have a lot of content we want to cover in our universities, in our colleges, in our classrooms. This does not require more class time. In fact, it will save you and your teachers class time because now we don't have to keep reteaching the same thing. If students remember information for the long term, for weeks, months, years, we can move on to more complicated, complex information for our students. So it does not require more class time. Does it require more grading? No. <laughs> None of us want more grading. In fact, retrieval practice doesn't have to be graded at all. There's a little secret. Sometimes we are so used to this process of every time students retrieve, we take their papers, and then we have to grade them. With retrieval practice, there is no grading involved. Am I suggesting that you test your students more often? No, not at all, because retrieval practice is a learning strategy. It's not an assessment strategy for our students. So when we kind of shift our thinking from testing and assessing students to helping their long-term learning with retrieval practice, we can engage in richer discussions in our classrooms. What's fantastic is you already do this. This is pretty common sense. It's based on 100 years of research, but you already do this. So you probably do some of these strategies. You can keep retrieval practice simple. For example, how many bones are in the human body? Just say it out loud. 206. Fantastic. Good job. Gold star. That's simple. That's it. That's retrieval practice. One of my favorite tools for retrieval practice is a pencil. That's it. I use pencils and I use index cards in my classrooms a lot. Especially with index cards, students can grab them on their way in or I can hand them out. They can retrieve two things. They could fill the whole index card with a brain dump and then they can pass them around. Or I can collect them, shuffle them up, hand them back out. But then you don't have that whole, like, can I borrow a piece of paper? Who has a pencil? Let me rip out the paper. Index cards are a great no-tech tool for retrieval practice. Of course, there are plenty of tech tools, lots of apps. One of my favorite apps is called Flip. It used to be called Flipgrid. If anyone is curious about that tech tool, please let me know. I love talking about Flip. Students can engage in retrieval practice asynchronously from home. They can engage in retrieval practice synchronously from home. Even if you're using Zoom, like many of us did, like I did for two years, students can type in one or two things they've learned simply into the chat. That's the thinking part. Then you can put them in breakout groups for the, the pair and share. 
Here are some more research-based tips. Try to provide retrieval practice as often as possible. Now, I understand a question I often get from teachers is like, when do I provide retrieval practice? My colleagues and I have published research showing that there is no optimal schedule. There is no recipe per se. This is the creativity as professors. Try to engage students in this retrieval practice as often as possible. Keep it flexible. Research demonstrates it doesn't matter if it's multiple choice, short answer, free recall, a brain dump. Keep it flexible for what works for your content area. Keep it quick. That emphasizes that retrieval is a learning strategy, not an assessment strategy. Keep it low stakes or no stakes. I don't grade those index cards. My students are so used to, I think, from their previous educational experience for 12 years before they come to college. Whenever I have them retrieve on an index card, then they come up to me at the end of class and say, would you like my index card? And I just like to stand there and say, well, why, why would I want that? They're like, well, don't, don't you want to grade that? No. No. And it's just this really cool shift to try out with your students. And again, you don't have to grade it at all. So three tips, or at least three questions, I like to ask my students to get them engaged in this process. It's one thing for us as educators to start all this retrieval practice. It's another thing to get our students on board, right? So here are three questions I like to ask my students. First, how do you study? That's it, pretty simple. How do you study for this class? How did you study in high school? Why do you study that way? Did a teacher teach you? Did a parent teach you? And does it work? Yeah, I hear some giggles. Does it work? And my students kind of look at me and they go, kinda? <laughs> um, I have a website with uh, YouTube videos, blogs, information specifically for students at retrievalpractice.org slash students. Um, but I love this question of does it work? Because our students recognize they can cram, they can get information in, and then poof, it's all gone. So these are three questions I encourage you to ask your students to start talking about the learning process. In the same way, you know your students best. Maybe you teach younger ages, maybe you educate educators. Ah, oh, imagine all the science of learning that we could do with teaching teachers about this. But you know your students best. Come up with the creativity. At the same time, research demonstrates, demonstrates that even brain dumps for Primary school children improves their learning, just like medical school and graduate school students. So you know your students best. I'm going to share a tiny bit of research from more than 100 years of cognitive science. I'm not going to show you any graphs. I've chosen not to. I can geek out all day here at the conference. I would love to. But I'm just going to show you some pictures, no graphs. The first thing I'd like to share is, again, 100 years of research demonstrates that retrieval practice boosts learning. Me and my colleagues recently published a review of the literature. We looked at 50 experiments conducted in real schools, in real classrooms, with retrieval practice including short answer questions, multiple choice, free recall, different types of schedules, a wide age range of students. And we showed that retrieval practice consistently benefits student learning. That's really important to me. Most of the research until recently was conducted in laboratory settings, but now we know that it improves long-term learning in real classrooms. We also know from a wealth of research that retrieval practice improves students' complex learning. I understand if this retrieval sounds like just memorization of vocabulary words. For a lot of us, or maybe most of us, that's not what we're looking for. And retrieval practice can be used for complex learning. I like to ask my students, give me an example from your own life. And tell me why that example is memorable. Those are pretty broad, complex questions. I don't ask my students to define what a neuron and an axon is. I don't ask them to define rapid eye movement in the stages of sleep. Instead, I ask them questions. What do you remember from class? Why does that stick in your mind? 
We also know that retrieval practice raises students' grades. In our research over the course of a whole school year, we were able to demonstrate that students' grades originally were at about a C average, about 75% is their test performance at the end of the school year. Once we engage students in secondary uh, education, in high school or grades 6 through 12, students' grades went from a C average to an A average with just some of this simple mini quizzes is another way to think about it. We also surveyed more than 1,000 students, and the overwhelming majority, 75% of students, said that retrieval practice reduces their anxiety. It does not increase their anxiety. This is not more testing. This is engaging students in practicing what they know. And it reduces their anxiety. That is so cool to me because then our students are feeling more confident. They're better prepared, like my music students. They can't just cram the night before, they're better prepared when they've engaged in retrieval practice throughout the process. Um, in terms of the next stages of research on retrieval practice, I'd like to share with you my newest project which is to bring together cognitive scientists from all over the world. This is what the field of cognitive science looks like today. These are colleagues that would love to collaborate with you. We want to do more research in schools, so if you are interested, please, please go to retrievalpractice.org slash scientists. If you have citations on your PowerPoint or presentation slides for the conference, check your citations because we all need to update our citations. It's time to do that, and I'm very proud of my colleagues who are conducting the newest research on retrieval practice. Now, I'd like us to take a step back and imagine what our educational systems could look like when we use the science of learning. Instead of our students engaging in that frustrating process, of constantly forgetting and then having to restudy, we can shift their success to retrieving. And instead of thinking about this aspect of a student struggling as a bad thing, this is a good thing. This is that desirable difficulty. So when we see our students thinking, this is good. Some students will say, my brain hurts. That's a good thing. We want students' brains to, to hurt a little bit. We're all going to be learning at the conference. Be mindful of your own retrieval. At the end of each session, write down one thing you just learned. Because we're all here in beautiful Sevilla. I would like to remember what I learned here at the conference. I'm sure you would like to remember beyond the whole week, beyond the month, beyond the year. So engage in retrieval practice for yourself. Our students, us, we can be more successful. Students are more likely to go on to graduate school if they achieve academic success, success in college and university, right? If we base our teaching on the science of learning, not just fads, not just anecdotes, our students are going to be excited about the learning process. So shifting beyond this forgetting, shifting beyond the frustration for us as educators, we can shift to learning. So how many bones are in the human body? 206. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I hope you will unleash the science of learning and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.